All right, we'll go ahead and uh, make our way to our seats and get started for our fourth and final session. And we'll try to draw some strings together and get to at least some of the questions that were submitted today. And we might, I might begin by just pointing out to Carl that I wore proper footwear for someone who grew up on the California coast and who's... Proper footwear, yeah. yes. Okay. Preferred yes. pronouns are dude and bra. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they are a step in the right direction. But. Also a little step up from yesterday's converse? S slightly. Okay, yeah. good. Okay, yeah. good. I'm moving in the right direction at least. <laughs> um, well, I know I speak for, for everyone, Dr. Truman, and thank you for your time today and for um, really helping us, even those of us who've read the book, it was so great to just have it distilled and a couple of lectures and to reflect on it. We went through all of your questions and all of them were read, not all of them will be able to be asked. And I hope you understand the reality of that. Some of them were repeated and many of you are off obviously tracking on the uh, same lines. And, and so we'll look forward to this time to maybe trying to pull some of this together and uh, tie, some, uh, tie some of the, uh, the themes together as well. I wanted to begin though actually with a, a question um, that I have, Carl, that I would love you to respond to is in an article a few years ago, the Scottish uh, theologian Donald MacLeod wrote, quote, a few years ago, Dr. Carl Truman, an American theologian, and then went on to quote you. Yeah. How, how would you respond to that? Um, Donald was a friend of mine <laughs> uh, uh, until about 10 days ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, not an American uh, the, the, the most body. charitable read I can put on that is, you know, he's, he's got to be 80. Maybe he's losing his marbles at this point, you know. So, uh, no, I, yeah, I received that. I wasn't impressed. Okay. So, so. Well, uh, he even got the title of the article wrong as well. Yeah, so. you know. Yeah. Um, uh, well, moving um, on to the more serious questions, maybe starting here, in many ways, picking up from where you ended, but coming at it from a, a negative side, what do you think are the more unhelpful ways that Christians have responded to the LGBTQ movement and our social changes recently? So thinking of the poor ways you've observed or we've yeah. seen in our churches. I think a couple of things come to mind. I think that, uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the revoice movement, which is the, it's the conference for those who identify as, as gay, queer, LGB Christians, T Christians, but who uphold the biblical uh, view of sexual morality, that, that marriage and sexual activity is only to be between a man and a woman within the bonds of marriage. Uh, I think in many ways that's a well-meaning, that's a well-meant attempt to address the issue, but I think it's problematic in that uh, well, first of all, as I indicated earlier, I think it concedes too much in using sexual identity labels and, and legitimating sexual identity labels. Secondly, I think for all of its good intentions, it, it creates an unstable middle that I think is unsustainable in the long run. And it's almost to me as if, you know, when you, as a teenager, a teenager asks the past, you know, how, how far can I go with my girlfriend and it still be okay? To which the answer should be, you know, as soon as you're asking that question, indicates you're already thinking along the wrong lines. Right. Uh, and I think that, that I would say, for all that I would not want to disparage the character of people involved in Revoice or their intentions, I do think that it is a profoundly wrong-headed and potentially very dangerous, unstable middle that's being constructed there. Uh, on the other hand, I do think there are churches that I think there is some truth in the, the idea that uh, LGB stuff has been singled out as the single most unforgivable sin. Uh, and there are those, I've talked to some, uh, who say, you know, as soon as you're converted, you should be delivered from this temptation. And I think that is equally problematic because that sets up a bar where you're bound to have people crushingly defeated by it. I don't think that the Lord has singled out uh, sexual sin is the one thing that you're uh, cured of uh, as soon as as soon as you're converted. So I think there's a danger on both sides to, if, if you like, we'll put it this way, to set the bar too low or to set the bar too high. Uh, I think it is a, it's something that, that needs to be put to death each, each day in the same way that greed or heterosexual temptation uh, needs to be so. So I think the danger is 
you know, there's almost an equal and opposite danger to the, the revoice move here. Excellent, thank you. Um, several questions that you know as a Christian, as a friend, as a pastor, of people dealing with just practical impacts on their workplaces and yeah. the realities of it. So several questions along the lines of um, how would you suggest addressing transgender individuals in the workplace when you're legally required to use someone's pronouns? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, do you have any wisdom on navigating the uh, idea of misgendering becoming a punishable offense in a workplace? Yeah. Um, any, any thoughts along those lines? Well, on one level, I think uh, the, the whole idea of misgendering is, is a ridiculous idea. I, I, I definitely think that what we're seeing emerging on that front is, uh, well, when you do have cases of individuals who choose their gender by the day, and, and they do exist, uh, then it makes the misgendering thing a kind of gotcha. And my own suspicion is that there's a lot more going on behind the idea of making misgendering a punishable offense than just misgendering. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's the old Stalinist, tell me what the man's doing and I'll tell you what crime he's committing kind of thing. Now, moving then down to the level of the individual, what about the individual confronted in the workplace with having to, to use a pronoun for a transgender person? Uh, I'm conscious that that is not an issue I'm facing in my workplace. So I'm conscious, uh, and I'm always hesitant to give advice that could cost somebody else their job but will cost me nothing. I would say in those situations, act in accordance with your conscience. I think if, uh, if I was a pastor of a church and I had a congregant come to me and say, uh, there's this guy Dave at my work and he's now Diane and I've been told to refer to him as Diane, what should I do? And, I, and I've been referring to him as Diane. Uh, I don't think I would implement church discipline against that person. I don't think I would. I would say, well, you need to act in accordance with your own conscience. I, I'm aware that not all Christians agree with that. Sure. I'm aware that some would push back hard and say, no, you're, you're living by lies at that point. Mm -hmm. So I say, my discomfort is I just find it very hard to lay down a hard and fast rule for other people when it isn't currently going to be applied to myself at this point. Would you have any um, agreement with some pastoral strategies I've heard sort of, you know, just don't use pronouns at all, you can use someone's proper name yeah. repeatedly, even if yeah. it's a little bit awkward um, yeah. linguistically, or even I've heard suggestions that you can speak to the person and say, look, I disagree with this, I'm a Christian, if you ever yeah. want to talk about it, I will, yeah. but I will call you by this yeah. because I'm going to respect you yeah. and, and this request. Yeah, I do. I, I think uh, my memory is if you go back and look at my book, I was very careful in the sections where I dealt with Bruce slash Caitlyn Jenner simply to avoid the pronoun issue. Yeah. Primarily on the grounds there that I wanted the book to be read by LGBTQ people and for them not to be able to pull on that and say, oh, well, we can dismiss it because he's misgendered the person here. Um, and I think when I was speaking about Jenner in my first or second lecture today, if you'd listen carefully, I was very careful to avoid. I referred to Bruce slash Caitlyn Jenner, and I was very careful to avoid pronouns. And that was on the grounds that I don't know many of you, and I don't know if there's somebody in the audience who's really genuinely wrestling with this, and for whom that might have created a roadblock that, that prevented you hearing the rest of what I was saying. So I tried carefully to avoid that myself uh, in, in the, the situation. In terms of pastoral situations, I could certainly envisage a situation. One of the things that I'm struck by in, in this particular moment is if, if such and such a person is not talking to me, to whom are they talking? And this was why I didn't sign. I was asked to sign the Nashville Statement and didn't sign it. And there are a number of reasons why I didn't sign it, but one of them was I felt if I signed that Nashville Statement, it automatically stops me talking to some of the people involved in Revoice. And I'm not sure that I want to stop that conversation at this point because I'm not sure that that conversation has run its full course in order to try to persuade people of a better way. And if I sign that document, uh, then I'm closing down that conversation. And I could, I, I, I could imagine a pastoral situation where somebody comes who's struggling with gender dysphoria, transgender stuff, and a pastor makes the strategic decision that I am going to use your preferred pronoun 
I'm going to make it very clear to you that I'm not doing that because I approve of, of you or because I really think you, you're a woman when you're actually a man. I'm doing it because I don't want the pronoun to be the thing that stops us talking about this issue. I could see a situation where that is legitimate. Uh, I'm not willing to say that is not legitimate in any situation ever. I'm not sure that that would be the normative thing, but I'm not prepared at this point to say uh, no way, not never on that. And even in your answer, you're making the distinction you gave us in your final lecture between ideology and individual. Yeah, yeah. And, and the individual yeah. interaction sometimes creates a certain response that you yeah. wouldn't have if you were on a, you know, dealing with the political movement. Yeah, yeah. And I think part of the issue here, of course, is that this has come upon us very quickly. We've not had a long time to think about it. We've not thought through all of the implications. So a lot of the answers we give at these particular things at this moment in time are very provisional. Yeah. And when, when I'm not sure about something, my tendency is to try to err on the side of charity on the grounds that I think charity is probably a more forgivable sin than, than over-harshness, mm -hmm. if I could put it that way. Um, and it's why I said in, in, in my lecture, I remember when I'm teaching candidates for the ministry and you would get asked, what would you do in this pastoral situation? And my answer always started off with, well, every situation is unique. So I can't say, here's the 10 steps to solving this problem. But let's take a particular example. And then I would say, in this situation, I would have done, I would have done that. Yeah, so true. Um, Similar, but maybe broader, and given your background uh, in your family and public education, and then also you talked about the letter earlier on, would you have counsel for Christians? Many, there are many Christians, many of our churches that work mm -hmm. as teachers and administrators yeah. in the public school system. Is there a point do you, where do you think it's just going to be no longer viable that Christians mm -hmm. are involved? And is there any way that you would encourage any sort of pushback so that the Christians that want to glorify God and teach yeah. kids can continue to do so? Well, first of all, I would say to anybody who's teaching the public school system, uh, that is, I would regard that as a very courageous thing to do at this point in time. I'm very grateful for, for the presence of Christian teachers. You know, it strikes me that, you know, I'm here this weekend giving lectures on this stuff, and there's a sense in which, you know, my career has taken an odd turn, but has sort of been enhanced by this stuff in a weird way. Whereas this stuff is, is career-ending for a lot of people. There's a lot at stake. And I do think that uh, Christian teachers in the public uh, school system, first of all, we need to pray for them and encourage them as much as we can. We need to pray that they're given wisdom how to handle these things. I am always, uh, I always hesitate to generalize because America is a huge country, and the public school system is not monolithic. The public schools in Grove City College, uh, in Grove City in Western Pennsylvania, very conservative very conservative. There's a, the, the school district is a very conservative school district. I would say the majority of people at the OP church I go to, well, many of them, at least a plurality of them, send their kids to public schools because it's Western Pennsylvania. It, there's, there isn't crazy stuff going on in our public schools at the moment. I assume it's very different in inner city San Francisco or Haight-Asbury or something like that. So I think, first of all, it's difficult to generalize. And I think, you know, I don't want to say there may come a time when Christian teachers have to pull out of the public school system, but there may come a time at individual schools or in individual districts where it just becomes impossible for Christians to work there. That's definitely, I think, on the horizon perhaps for many people. Um, how do we push back against this? I think it, clearly it's going to take courage, but w we do have civil rights in this country. We do have due process. Uh, my wife and I were at the Alliance Defending Freedoms conference a few weeks ago. I was invited to go, and <coughs> Ryan Anderson and I have been doing a sort of double act over the summer at various places, and we, we did it at the Alliance Defending Freedom. I feel inferior to him. He's been banned by Amazon, and they're still selling my book, you know, it's just kind of... <laughs> so I don't feel half the man Ryan is on this <laughs> issue at all. But, uh, uh, but one of the people who spoke there was the gym teacher, the football coach from Loudoun County, Virginia, who you know, shot to national fame the other week when he stood up at a school board meeting and kind of gave the answer that I didn't give a couple of minutes ago where he said, I'm not going to call some boy a girl in class. I'm not going to call a girl a boy. I'm not going to uh, deceive them. And I, and I think that's perfectly legitimate position to hold. He stood up and said that, and of course he was, you know, put on administrative leave within 24 hours because they'd had complaints. Well, he, in this talk, he said, you know, 
three parents had complained. I think 300 parents had complained about the transgender policies, uh, but that had just been ignored. I think three parents had complained about his comments. Well, he's fighting back. He's using the Alliance Defending Freedom. He's got legal representation. And I don't think that's, a, I don't think that's an easy or pleasant process, but it's got to be done. And there are groups, you know, if you're a public school teacher here today and you get into trouble in the workplace, then contact the Alliance Defending Freedom. Contact the Beckett Fund. There are well-heeled, legal, very talented legal organizations in this country that will take on pro bono significant legal cases. And I would say, you know, we're, okay, we're to obey the civil magistrate. Resistance and rebellion is not legitimate for Christians in, in, in one sense. But we live in a country where the law of rule is respected, where we have courts, where we have rights. And I would say if you're a public school teacher and you feel that you are being persecuted, marginalized, uh, suffering harassment because of your faith, contact one of these legal organizations and see if they will take your case on and push back. Um, it will take courage to do that. I don't know that I would have the courage to do that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm a courageous person at all on this. I'm conscious I have it pretty easy in the world I live in. But I think uh, push back, yeah. push back. Yeah, and for what it's worth, another group, the Pacific Justice Institute okay. is one here. They have an office in Sacramento, and we retained them during 2020, and they yeah. argued some cases before the Supreme yeah. Court, and they've been very helpful. Yeah. It's also pro bono. Yeah, yeah. and my, I mean, my email's on the, the Grove City College website. I am not involved with these organizations formally. But if you don't know how to get in touch with them, you contact me. I can put you in touch. I can put you in touch with somebody. Um, and the, the Beckett Fund, you know, the Beckett Fund doesn't just defend Christians. The Beckett Fund will defend Jewish and Muslim people who are being hassled. It's a First Amendment yeah. organization, predominantly Catholic in terms of the staff. But uh, my wife and I were tremendously, we went to these two, the ADF, and then we went to a Beckett Fund breakfast. And I would say there are some very scary 30-something women attorneys out there who are taking on the big boys in the, on the religious freedom thing. Yeah. And we were very encouraged. I, was thinking, I thought, I mean, these attorneys, they look like China dolls, but gosh, I would not want to get on the wrong side of them. So, you know, if you get into trouble with your school district, they're going to love the young women attorneys that come knocking on their doors. They're going to love it. So I would say, you know, use the rights you have. We all worry about our rights being taken away. Well, let's use them while we have them. Yeah. Let's use them while we have them. And one of the things we've done as a church in our public prayers and in our prayer meetings is praying for uh, the judicial process, praying for Christian attorneys. We had yeah. an intern with us for over the summer and talking about the young rise of young attorneys, um, Christians yeah. going to the field. That's something yeah. that we should be doing along with reaching yeah. neighbors. And these are young attorneys who could make an awful lot of money yep. in mainstream practice, but they are passionately committed to the First Amendment. Um, passionately committed to many of them to the Christian faith uh, and you know let's use them let's use them and let's pray for Christian teachers as well yeah. and, and I have to say it's not just in public schools I've spoken at Christian schools where you know, the parents are putting pressure on the schools on these issues and you know, when parents who are writing the big checks for schools yeah. When they're going wobbly on this stuff, that's going to feed over into a Christian. You know, it's not just public school teachers who are going to come under pressure. Uh, I won't use the exact phrase that this. I was at a school, and one, one, one young teacher asked me, you know, what do I do when a 17-year-old girl, this is at a Christian school, tells me that her parents are paying for birthday, paying for her to have breast enhancements? That's a Christian school. That's a conservative Christian school. So I think we need to be careful, and, and you know, don't just assume this is a public school issue. It's coming soon to a public school, a Christian school near you because Christian parents are being swept over by this stuff as well. So I think we need to bear that in mind. Well, thanks for one more thing to keep me up. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, and this next question, question may be put on back on your historical theologian hat. In the Augustinian tradition, concupiscence was a threat to holiness, whereas in identity, modern identity issues today, it's an affirmed thing. Can you sort of comment on that theological shift and, and issue that's been lost in, in the church? Yeah, and, and, and this is where I don't quite get what the Revoice guys are trying to do, in that 
uh, you know, one of the things I said recently to one of the, on email to a, to a revoice advocate, who's a fr you know, it's a friendly exchange. It was not. A I say I, I can't understand why you want to use the term gay as an identity term when the gay refer when gay is a term used to refer to the erotic desire to have sexual relations with another man. To which his response was, well, no, we're not using it in that term. We're not talking about wanting sexual relations. To which I then responded, sort of, so what you're saying is that you, you, want to, you want it to be legitimate for, for men to be able to have deep friendships with each other of the kind that were very typical, for, say, example, in the Victorian era. They weren't erotic, but they were very deep male-male friendships. Well, no, we want more than that. To which, well, I, I'm just not getting the distinction. And at this point, my sort of, I'm not really a fundamentalist, but my kind of fundamentalist instincts start to kick in and saying, I just don't think the Bible's that difficult on this point. I, I think if the Bible was more difficult on this point, there would have been more confusion throughout history than we've had. It's only become confusing when it's become convenient for it to become confusing. So I think this distinction, that this, this idea that same-sex attraction can be somehow morally neutral or even you know, affirmable in a way that separates it from the problematic nature of homosexual desire. I just don't buy it. Yeah. And I think it's, it seems to me to be the preserve of certain very clever, high-flying philosophical types. It's not the preserve of the man and the woman in the pew. Would you take just a moment to find concupiscence, and do you think that's a helpful it's kind of self-love? Uh, um, uh, is it a helpful? I, I just don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't think we, we need to talk about concupiscence. I think okay. sinful desire yeah, does there. does the job for us. Does the job for us? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, we talked a little bit about this last night, but um, some other questions similarly in the books you've recommended, um, uh, Strangers in a Strange Land by Charles Schubert, yep. Archbishop of Philadelphia, uh, Rod Dreher's books, he's Eastern Orthodox. Yep. Um, the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholics seem far ahead of the Protestants yep. in terms of moral ethics and uh, what's going on in society. Any comment about why that is that, why that is? And are there yeah. some um, maybe myopia in the Protestant churches that needs to be expanded on these issues? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a whole variety of reasons as to why Protestantism lags behind. I think, first of all, we've, we've tended to neglect the tradition of, of moral theology that has been a strong part of Roman Catholic reflection throughout the centuries. Uh, uh, and there are various reasons for that. One, I think, is a neglect of philosophy within Protestant ranks. Two, has been a certain biblicism, which we now find is, you know, it's getting very... The moral questions are becoming so technical that it's becoming obvious that we simply can't find a Bible verse that answers the problem. I mean, think about murder. Should you murder somebody? No, thou shalt not murder. What about in vitro fertilization? How do you deal with that? Well, in order to address in vitro fertilization ethically, you've got to have a pretty comprehensive understanding of what it means to be a human being. There is no Bible verse. There has to be an anthropology that lies behind that. And we've sort of neglected that kind of stuff in Protestantism. The good news is that a lot of the Catholic work in this area is entirely appropriatable by Protestants, that the issues that divide us from Catholics, uh, issues of justification by grace through faith, church authority and sacraments, generally don't impact moral theology in that sense. So I was saying last night, I think one of the most important books for pastors to read at this moment in time is a book by my friend uh, Carter Sneed at Notre Dame. Carter is a Catholic bioethicist. His book, which was named as one of the top 10 books of uh, 2020 by the Wall Street Journal, I didn't get a look in. He beat me. Uh, <laughs> what it means to be human is, I think, an excellent study of beginning of life, fertilization, and end of life ethical issues that any Protestant can read with profit. So I would recommend work by Carter Sneed. I also think that Catholicism has, has had a much richer understanding of the significance of embodiments of human beings over the centuries. I'm not quite sure why, but when you think about a lot of Protestants, we tend to think of the gospel in terms of forgiveness of sins, which it is, partly. 
And as I said last night, the interesting thing about forgiveness of sins is Jesus doesn't actually need to rise from the dead for our sins to be forgiven. We just need a perfect sacrifice. But he's resurrected. And then we're going to be resurrected. And that points to the fact that at the heart of biblical, biblical faith, the body is pretty important. And I think there's a tendency in Protestant circles uh, to, t- to think of ourselves really as spirit or soul inhabiting a body. When you think about it, that's the conceptual distinction that transgenderism relies upon to a large extent. You know, when you listen to transgender people talking, they will typically talk about inhabiting their bodies. They, the them, the real them, is in the body. And I think one of the things we need to recover as Protestants, and there is some good work going on in Protestantism, but there is longer history of it in Catholicism, is to realize that, that we are not... We do not inhabit our bodies. Our bodies are an integral part of who we are. Thomas Aquinas, in his treatment of the end, time, uh, the end of life, has a, a section in the Summa Theologiae where he says, you know, when you die, your soul goes immediately to be with God. But then he says, but it's not you. He said, it's not really you until your body joins it on the day of resurrection. And I think that's an important thing to remember. Yes, well, I'm not a soul sleep guy. When we die, we're immediately in the presence of the Lord. But it isn't fully us. The real us is body and soul. And I think what Catholicism has done well is you know, bodies are very important. And I think COVID exposed this a bit. Again, we were talking last night about one thing about Protestant worship is, and I think this is biblically correct, that the central point at which God meets us is, is in the preaching of the Word. The problem now in a highly technologized society is the body is almost irrelevant to that. You don't need to be with other bodies. You know, hey, during COVID, we can all just worship online. Whereas if you're a Catholic, you've actually got to go. I know they have certain, as always in Catholicism, there's always get-out clauses. But by and large, you've got to be there and take the elements. Now, don't get me wrong, I I don't believe the Mass should be the center of Christian piety. But I would say if you're a Catholic, you can never forget that you're a body because you receive grace through your body in a way that we tend to think of it, we receive it through our minds. And minds can be rather spooky and disembodied things when we think about them. So I think another reason why Catholicism is ahead of us on this is the body is very important. And um, John Paul II, his Theology of the Body is very significant. And a book I would recommend, it's written by a Catholic, but he wrote it, and in the foreword he says, I've written this book in a deliberately generically Christian way so that all Christians can appreciate it. Christopher West, he's a Catholic. He works, I think, for the equivalent of Catholic you know, crew. He's a sort of campus outreach guy for uh, Roman Catholicism. He's written a book, Our Bodies Tell God's Story that I think is one of the best books to put in the hands of young people to teach them biblical sexual morality. Again, I get kids at Grove will come and ask me in in my office and say, you know, what does the Bible teach about homosexuality or something? And, And I can point them to Bible verses. And that's enough for most of them. They want to take the Bible seriously. But I know at the back of their mind, they're they're thinking, why does the Bible say that? I when I was traveling to this LDS conference the other was given a lift by one of the Latter-day Saints, and I actually asked him, my wife said, okay, I said, why can't you drink coffee? And he laughed and he said, because God told us it's wrong. <laughs> and I said, well, why did God tell you it was wrong? And he said, well, perhaps it's because it's habit for me. And then it emerged later in the journey that his wife is sort of loves ice cream, and I made the sort of facetious comment, oh, so God hasn't banned everything that's habit-forming then. You can still enjoy ice cream as a, as a Latter-day Saint. Uh, but what I think was, you know, was interesting, that, that was not an adequate answer for me. God said you can't drink coffee. And on one level, yeah, okay, it's, if God has said that, that's adequate, but I want to know why. And I think that today's young people, uh, articulation of biblical sexual ethics has to do more than simply point them to Bible verses. That's not to say the Bible isn't sufficient. It is for knowing what biblical sexual ethics is. But if you can also point them to, do you know that the human body is created in a certain way so that certain sexual behaviors are good and certain sexual behaviors are bad? Certain sexual behaviors do incredible damage to us. 
I think that that kind of argument carries weight because then what you're telling the Christian young person is not simply, oh, God has said homosexuality is wrong. And in their mind, they're thinking, I know God said that, but did he just say it because he wants my gay friends to be unhappy and live unfulfilled lives? What you're actually saying is, God says this, the Bible says this, and it makes sense that the Bible says this when you look at how the world is structured and set up. So Christopher West, Our Bodies Tell God's Story, should be on the shelf, I think, of every pastor. And, you know, if you're looking, if pastors, if you're looking for a book to put into the hands of thoughtful young people who are genuinely wrestling with the disconnect between the friends they love and what the culture tells them and what the Bible tells them, I think that book will be helpful in persuading them that the Bible actually seeks the way it does for, for good reason. Excellent. Uh, maybe shifting gears a little bit and thinking about some of the themes you've drawn out and then how they show up in our circles. You've written and spoken a lot about celebrity culture in Christian ministry in America. Uh, you did a panel at T4G that you can still find online that was great. In fact, I'd like to quote you just briefly. You've written, the stadium platform is personality heavy and doctrine light. It has placed some very theologically incompetent people in positions of significant public... Did I say that? That's pretty yeah. strong. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like everyone on TikTok. Ah, is good, good job I didn't name any names. I might have got sued. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's, uh, <laughs> But you, but you did say that some very theologically incompetent people are in positions of significant public influence. Yeah, I'll tell you what I really think one of these days. Solely, yeah, it's it's great stuff. <laughs> on their ability to draw a crowd. Yeah. So what's the relationship between, we'll just call it the celebrity pastor phenomenon yeah. in American Christianity and, and outside America, and some of the narrative and expressive individualism and things you've drawn out here. Yeah, well, expressive individualism has various pathologies that would lead to that. One of the things is, of course, expressive individualism tends to exalt performance. And those who perform and draw the biggest crowd tend to be the people we admire the most. And I would say American culture is particularly vulnerable to this. And you, you see this in politics and you see it in sport. In, in Britain, you tend to think in terms of political parties. You vote for a party. You don't vote for the president. You vote for a party. You vote for the local MP. Uh, generally speaking, with some exceptions, David Beckham being one, you tend to think of the sports team rather than the figures. We don't have the plethora of sports personalities that you have in quite the same way. So America has always, I think, tilted towards seeing the individual as, as uniquely important and critical as a cultural figure. Combine that with expressive individualism, and you get this kind of big man culture. Uh, and I remember in class many years ago at Westminster asking, just asking the students, who's the most influential pastor in your life? And I was shocked that none of the students in that class mentioned their own pastor, unless their own pastor happened to be John Piper or Tim Keller. They tended to name big personalities, and that's not a criticism of John Piper or Tim Keller. It's a criticism of the culture so much that they tended to think the guys whose books they read or whose videos they watched were the influential pastors in their lives. So I think there's something uh, very much in American culture that tilts that way. And I think it connects to expressive individualism because expressive individualism exalts outward performance. And the most successful outward performers are the ones who draw the biggest crowds. And that's why, you know, in our Christian subculture, the biggest churches are the ones that have the most charisma from our perspective. Thank you. What about um, more ordinary, modest churches like what's represented here by and large? You've mentioned Yuval Levine's work, A Time to Build, and that institutions have become platforms of performance, not places of formation. Yeah. Is that also true in many, how many Christians view their local church? And yeah. what are some ways that we as just church members and Christians can uh, mortify that, if that's yeah. the right word, and repent yeah. of these kinds of perspectives of yeah. the church? Well, first of all, I think being aware of it, once you're aware of something, it at least allows you to spot it or be more, you know, more to, to see it more astutely. I think part of the problem we have is we're caught in a world where yeah, we're all consumers of religion now. I think Tocqueville sort of puts his finger on it when in, in Democracy in America he talks about, you know, one of the most remarkable things about the American experiment is religious freedom. And I'm a big fan of religious freedom. I don't want to live in China. Uh, I'm glad that I can go to the church of my choice on a Sunday and worship in a way that's free and, and not interfered with by, by the state. Religious freedom is a virtue in a society. But as with so many things, it's not an unqualified virtue. 
that when you have religious freedom, when you have religious choice, power tilts towards the congregants. The congregant starts to become more of a consumer. Uh, 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 there's no way of getting around that. And then when you add to that the automobile, so that geography is effectively eliminated as a factor, the power of the congregant is enhanced even further. Good example of this, we disciplined a man at my church when I was an OP pastor outside Philadelphia. We brought disciplined charges against three people for different things, serious things. All three of them ended up being excommunicated. All three of them are now worshiping in other churches. One of them is a member of a church that is so say a sister denomination to the Orthodox Presbyterian Church and is meant to honor the decisions of Orthodox Presbyterian Church courts. Well, what does that mean? That means church, church discipline is dead as far as recovering the offender or bringing about repentance is concerned. You can still vindicate the name of Christ because we took a stand against that person and nobody can say that my church doesn't take sin X seriously because we dealt with that man who committed it. But it does mean it, it's, it, it's emblematic of, hey, if you don't like your church, if you don't like the way the pastor dresses, you can move to another church. And that's expressive individualism. Church becomes that which scratches my need, that makes me feel good about myself on a Sunday. And we can all tilt that way. And I, pull, I, 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 I provoke my Roman Catholic friends on this by saying, you know, you're Protestants now because the essence of Protestantism is religious choice. And you choose to be a Catholic because you could choose not to be a Catholic now in a way that wouldn't have been the case in the Middle Ages. One thing I would say, though, uh, about Roman Catholicism, and this is something that Protestants, I think, need to recapture, and it would require a tremendous self-discipline. I remember uh, chatting to a Roman Catholic friend, and he was complaining about the deacon at his parish church, and he said, he's been preaching these, uh, these pro-abortion homilies. And I said to him, well, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to move to another church? And he said, I can't. I said, why not? He said, because I'm required to worship in the church, in the parish where I reside. And I thought, that's interesting. No Protestant would ever think that way. No Protestant would ever think that way. Oh, the guy said something I don't like. I'm not going back to that place. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that Roman Catholicism is admirable at all, but I think that attitude to the church is kind of admirable. That this person didn't put... You know, the first thing that he disagreed with that happened at the church didn't become an excuse for him to simply disappear one Sunday and reappear somewhere else. So I think one of the Protestants have got to do is we have to discipline ourselves on this. We have to decide, I'm a member of this church. The vows I've taken of membership in this church are as serious as the vows the minister has taken in his ordination. They're not as elaborate. They don't bind me to as many things. But those are solemn vows before God. And I don't break solemn vows before God because I don't like the tie that the pastor wore last Sunday. Or I don't like the fact that there was a guitar. I mean, I'm not a big guitar, no offense, not a big guitar and worship guy myself, but I don't regard it as sinful. And I wouldn't leave a church because, hey, somebody's introduced a guitar and worship, but some people do. And I would say, no, your membership vows, they are as serious as marriage vows. They're vows taken before God. And we as Protestants need to start taking them seriously. And that means we're going to have to put up with certain things in our local churches that we, don't disagree with, that we don't agree with and we don't like. But if they're not germane to the gospel witness, then we just got to put up with them. Amen. Um, how can we love and care for people who oppose our views on all these things? What are good strategies of conversing and having conversation on these yeah, issues. Yeah. Uh, well, I think, first of all, Twitter is not a good strategy. Uh, I think the, uh, the only three people who should ever have been allowed Twitter accounts, Martin Luther, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Oscar Wilde. I think those, those guys could have carried it off. Everybody else is just a liability out there on Twitter. Um, uh, I, I think, to go back to my last lecture, I think this can really only happen in our age in a, at a local level. I don't think engaging online, engaging in a disembodied way is, is going to work. I think the, the only people who disagree with you that you can have a real influence over are the people you live next door to, who can see the way you live your life and can know that you care for them even though you disagree with them. I think the parable of the Good Samaritan is, is very significant on, on, on that front. So I think that the answer is, is local. And you might say, well, that's a very... Uh, 
you know, you know th that's a defeatist. Well, I'm going to say, no, I think that's a realist. Because most of us, even in the good old days, would only really have influence in our local communities. And I think, okay, once you've had a huge impact in your local community, then move on to transforming the nation. Sure. But let's, let's have influence over the people that we rub shoulders with. We, but we can, my focus is always on the students these days. They're the people that I can have most influence on, not the people I write for or do books or online. But my major focus is my classroom teaching because those are the kids that I can actually have an influence on because guess what? They're the ones I can have a conversation with. Yeah. They're the ones who, you know, they can have come out as gay, but they can know that I treat them as a human being and their gayness is in kind of irrelevant to me in the way I actually treat them as a human being. Mm -hmm. My house is still open. I mean, my wife and I, we couldn't do it during COVID, but we try to open our house to hospitality. Any kid in my class, certainly, says, come on over, open house. I don't care what you believe. I don't care what your proclivities are on this, that, or the other. My house is open to anybody in, in my class. Come over, have a chat. Let's just hang out on the deck. Uh, I think we can all do that kind of stuff. And building those kind of relationships will put the lie to the caricatures about us being hateful people. The nut on the internet might still think you're a hateful person, but you're never going to meet them anyway. Right. And you're not called to influence that person. You're called to influence the kid in the class, yeah. the neighbor, the person down the street. Yeah, absolutely. I know I, I can say from personal experience after reading your book, it helped me in personal conversations. I had one recently with um, a law student going into LGBTQ civil liberties, another with some neighbors, to just reframe it. Well, before we talk about what I believe as a pastor and Christian yeah. on this, let's talk about what we're all a part of and how we yeah. understand who we are. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm there with you in yeah. this. Now let's talk about what God's yeah. word says. That, just understanding even what you've taught today helps reset those conversations in yeah. multiple ways. Yeah, excellent. Thanks. Um, how do you, and how would you recommend as you're talking about these things, do you pivot from identifying the problem? So we can, we can explain to our neighbor, let's say, expressive mm. individualism and all these things to the solution in the gospel yeah. and turn to God's word. How, how do you recommend or some strategies of making that pivot in a relationship and conversation? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. I and mean, one thing I found that has worked with the, the sort of the 18 to 22-year-olds at Grove that I talk about this stuff is, um, you know, the Bible's great because the Bible frames the gospel in various different ways. And the, I've tinkered around with, with some of the courses I teach. One of the things I found most reson resonates is this freedom and belonging thing. Okay, let's look at freedom of love. We all want to be free, don't we? Yes. We all want to belong, don't we? Yes. Well, let's look at some of the ways people have tried, particularly in modernity, to be free and to belong. And let's see how well it's worked out. And then, you know, you go to the Bible and say, well, what, what, the interesting thing about the Bible is that the Bible sees no antithesis between freedom and belonging. The sun sets you free, you're free indeed. How are you free indeed? By being identified with Christ, by belonging to the church. So I found the language of freedom and belonging seems to resonate with the rising generation uh, in, in, in powerful ways. Helpful. Um, in consi similar, somewhat similar, in considering the, quote, inward turn in your first lecture, um, how significant does the historical and objective realities of the gospel become and the resurrection of Christ? You touched on it a little bit yeah. earlier, but how would you um, tease that out further? Very important. And, and this is where I didn't talk about this, but Augustine's Confessions is a good book to read from this perspective. <clears throat> because one of the bits of pushback I typically get from students when I'm laying this stuff out is, but hang on a minute, Truman. You know, the inward space didn't, wasn't created by Rousseau, wasn't created by Descartes, wasn't created by the Reformers. What about the Psalmists? You know, read the Psalms, and there's a lot of psychology in the Psalms. The Psalm laments, the Psalm feels. Read the Iliad. You know, Achilles is there sulking in his tent. The guy is sulking. The guy has an inner space. And uh, I want to say, of course, and what I'm saying in my course is not that the inner space is invented at the Enlightenment or just before, but that the inner space takes on a peculiar authority. But the inner space also takes on a peculiar restriction at the Enlightenment as well. And the inner space of, uh, of the Enlightenment, one moves inward in order to stay inward. One moves inward to find journey's end, to find who you really are. Now, Augustine's Confessions is good because the whole book is introspection in many ways. He's examining his heart. He's examining his mind. But it's also cast as a prayer to God. And with Augustine, what you have is this beautiful dramatic movement that he moves inward 
only so that he can move outward again. And there's that beautiful line near the beginning where it says, the heart is restless above all things until it finds its rest in thee. And there you have the identity of Augustine. He moves inward. He finds that his heart is restless. But he only finds his identity then when he moves outward to God. And that's where I would say, okay, so we talk about these. So you have this restlessness in your space. Well, let's find out. Let's look at Augustine. And let's see where Augustine finds rest. He's moved inward, and that's right and proper because he has to know himself. But he doesn't end there. He realizes that this restlessness derives from the fact that, that he has just moved inward. And he now needs to move outward to the incarnation, the cross and resurrection of Christ in order to find rest. So that's how I would pitch, would pitch that. Excellent. Thank you. Um, a lot of what you've talked about, your work in the book, is essentially, you could summarize, as Oppenheim said, that is it helping fish realize they're actually in water, pointing out the water, um, to make conscious what is formerly intuitive. Um, what wisdom do you have for pastors as they shepherd and teach to help Christians realize the water that we're in and to bring out some of these things in ordinary ministry? Yeah, well, I think it has to be done through preaching. You can, you can do some of this stuff through preaching. Uh, you know, I, I think with... Uh, I'm trying to think of specific examples. I don't think it's necessary for pastors to be cultural critics to preach, but I think it can help. Uh, I don't think a pastor should spend more time reading cultural criticism than he does reading the Bible. But I think it can help. It can help to know your audience. It can help to know the way they're thinking. And then there are subversive ways that one can address these things. Uh, as I told you, you know, uh, freedom and belonging. Uh, that sort of theme can be used subversively uh, from, from the pulpit. Uh, as an example, uh, I, um, I'm not sure if I used this in the lecture or whether it was in a private conversation. I was talking about a young person I was having discussion with it within the last year who told me, you know, my problem is, you know, I'm a Christian, but I think I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. And I said to him, well, okay, you know, tell me how it started, you know. Uh, I'm sorry you feel that way, but, uh, you know, I, I don't want to judge you at this point, but just tell me why you, why do you feel that way? And he told me this story about how when he was at school, um, he was a kind of geeky character and the, the boys all picked on him and the girls were kind to him and he wanted to belong. He wanted to be truly part of the girls' team. And that's where it all started. And I was able to say to him, you know, I, I don't think your problem is that you're a woman trapped in a man's body. I think your problem is that you have a legitimate desire to love and to be loved and to belong. To have people treat you decently as a person. The idiom you found to express that has been provided by the unfortunate circumstances of your background. But I think, you know, addressing issues like that. So if I was addressing transgenderism from the pulpit, I might use that kind of anecdote. Uh, my first port of call might not be to harangue people, this is ridiculous, you shouldn't feel that, but to acknowledge and say, these feelings are as powerful as, as the loss of a cell phone. They're historically conditioned. It's not that the world has been full of transgender people throughout history and now they're finally getting encouraged to speak up. No, this is actually a problem that's been generated by modern society. But it doesn't make it less real. Right. What it does tell me, though, is that, that people have a real problem, and they're really struggling with something, and this is the tool that society has given them to solve the problem with. But let me tell you, suicide rate among people who've transitioned is, in the United States, runs at 40%. That's catastrophic. Four out of six human beings who go through this will kill themselves. That should break our hearts. Uh, well, we, somebody might, in the pulpit, you could then say, but somebody might push back and say, but pastor, that's because America's not accepting of such people. Well, let's think about Sweden. Sweden has been very accepting of this for a very long time. And you look at the suicide rate in Sweden for transgender people, and it's running at roughly 40%. Four out of six human beings struggling with this who go through this process will take their own lives. And that's tragic and heartbreaking. Then I think I'd say from the pulpit, and you know what, that suicide rate tells me something. It tells me there's a real problem here. And these are broken and agonized people. And their problem is really serious. But it also tells me that transitioning is not the solution. And we need, we need to take this problem seriously. 
Now let me tell you what I think the solution might be. Now let me tell you how I think these people can realize their freedom and belonging. And then I think I'd apply it to the congregation and say, and by the way, that's not just to the individuals in the congregation who might be struggling with that. That's an application to us all. These people have got to be part of our community. They've got to know they belong here, regardless of what they're struggling with. They have to know that they're loved as human beings and belong here. So that's how I might sort of address that strategically from the pulpit. Yeah, uh, my, my impression of, of kids at Grove, and they're not entirely representative of the country, I know, but my impression is that culture warrior language doesn't speak to this generation. So I've told the students, think about yourself as engaging in cultural protest. Because protest can be peaceful, but still very strong. And I like to say, we're going to get in my class is cultural protest. I'm going to give you a cultural war. I'm not, I'm not in the slash and burn business. I'm in, the, I'm in the business of protesting the culture by presenting you with a better alternative. Counterculture. Yeah. yeah. Everything you want, I can give it to you better in yeah. the church. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Well, before we get to maybe a last question, I wanted to do just a brief run through some of your books. Um, we have them here. Maybe you could just point some things out. <clears throat> First, I have... Um, Three uh, collections of essays, Minority Report, Wages of Spin, and Fools Rush In Where Monkeys Fear to Tread, which is an interesting uh, title. Uh, maybe here in Wages of Spin, you have an essay that uh, we actually hand out in our membership class, What Can Miserable Christians Sing? The one, the title of which Don McLeod didn't remember, yes. Yep, yep. Uh, and uh, you, write in, you write in there, a diet of unremittingly jolly choruses and hymns inevitably creates an unrealistic horizon of expectation which sees the normative Christian life as one long triumphalist street party, a theologically incorrect and pastorally disastrous scenario in a world of broken individuals. So even there, you're drawing out the use of singing psalms and songs of lament and yeah. connecting still on has connection with your work even here today. Yeah, yeah. Um, an essay I've used in discipleship from Fools Rush In is an unmessianic sense of non-destiny. And one of the things uh, you wrote there is, uh, we have no special destiny in ourselves as isolated units, any more than bits of our own bodies do in isolation from one another. Um, this is an important insight that should profoundly shape our thinking and indeed our praying. My special destiny as a believer is to be part of the church and it is the church that is the big player in God's wider plan, not me. The problem today is that too many have the idea that God's primary plan is for them and the church is secondary. So helpful. helpful church thing. is a platform for performance right. rather than a place for formation. Yeah. So these are collections of essays that, uh, that Carl has written that are available also on the bookstall. This book I love. I don't hear people talk about much. Are you Reformation Yesterday, Today, Forever? Um, any uh, remark you want to make on this book, why you wrote it? I uh, wrote it in three days. Uh, I was caught. I suddenly realized that I was meant to Your be speaking, three days days spe speaking at a conference I'd forgotten I was speaking at, so I sat down and, and wrote it frantically over three days. But it's essentially, I think it's three essays looking at aspects of the Reformation that, that are still useful for the church today. Yeah. So... Uh, well, that you wrote uh, this in three days is depressing me now. Thanks. Carl. It was insane. I couldn't do it today. That's a young man's exercise. That the, is. The, the chapter on Luther's theology of glory <laughs> yeah. is really good. I thought also um, the, your introduction to the Reformation as a pastoral uh, issue, sparked by pastoral concern, right. was really helpful. And I think even uh, catches some of your thoughts even here that we're identifying problems and responding pastorally and working out our theological response to them was helpful. Also along the same lines, um, Luther on the Christian Life, excellent book. Any uh, couple words on this? Luther's one of my favorite theologians, and uh, I'm not a Lutheran theologically, but I've probably learned as much from Luther as from anybody. So that was, uh, and I deliberately pitched it as a, a book about how Luther would conceptualize the Christian life from a pastoral perspective. Uh, which had not typically been, you know, there are not a lot of books on Luther that take on, okay, how did Luther think about his theology relative to the pastoral ministry? So that was my interest yeah. in that book. I didn't just want to do another book on Luther, on Christianity. I wanted right. to give it that pastoral take. I think that comes through, and especially the three central chapters on the theology of the word and the word preached are very helpful. And you tie in, again, a lot of these themes on the objectivity 
of the Word of God preached versus our inward explorations mm. and really exposing some shallowness in Christian piety in churches today. It was very helpful. We had several read in our church. Um, you contributed to the Five Solas series, Grace Alone, um, Sola Gratia. Any comment you want to make on this book? Uh, it is what it says on the cover. It's a book about grace. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Didn't write that in three days. Took yeah. me a bit longer. Okay, but, good. Uh, <laughs> good. On what the reformers taught about yeah. solo gratia, about grace alone, helpful. Um, and there is a section in Augustine, and Augustine's Confessions in there as well. I so put some of my ideas on that down. Yeah, so. there you go. Um, we looked at this at our workshop yesterday, the creedal imperative. And you mentioned in your new book the church's return to its creedal confessional foundations away from narrative personal theology. Mm. What do you think is the importance of the creedal heritage of the church? I think it, uh, there are a lot of, of reasons why creeds are important. Uh, one of them is I think it gives us historical rootedness. And again, one of the things that struck me about some of the young Christians at Grove College is they're looking for Christianity that wasn't invented last Sunday. They're wanting historical roots. And I think creeds and confessions do that. Secondly, they present the Christian faith in a way that is sort of fairly comprehensive. You know, our theology of marriage does not stand in isolation from our understanding of the image of God or the doctrine of God. And sometimes it can be hard to, to connect those dots. But when you've got theology laid out in a concise and comprehensive form, it becomes easier to see, how, oh yeah, actually the issue of marriage is significant for my doctrine of God. And that if I shift on this, then there's a whole lot of other shifts that have to take place. So I think good confessions, London Confession, Westminster Confession, Belgian Confession, they put together Christian theology in a way that allows us to see actually how much of it hangs together as a coherent whole. And to, you know, to, to abandon one part is to abandon another. I remember reading an article in First Things by a Catholic theologian, used to be a colleague of mine at the University of Aberdeen, Francesca Murphy, who referred to gay marriage as blasphemous. And I'd never seen such strong language used before, and it actually made me sit up and pay attention. I thought, Actually, when you think that marriage connects, to human marriage connects to the, the relationship between Christ and the church and therefore has significant theological implications, yes, I can see that alterations, and I would want to say, you know, no-fault divorce is blasphemous on that front in that, yeah, changes to marriage, that's not just changes to a social arrangement. It, it has implications for our theology as a whole as well. Excellent. Maybe one more republicrat. Yeah, that's, um, that, that, I, st I founded cancel culture. Uh, I got canceled by the right for Republicrat some 10 or 11 years ago. My own, a church in my own denomination withdrew an invitation to preach because they, I got an email from the pastor, who I've since become good friends with. I won't mention his name, but emailed me to say, uh, my wife read your book, and we think having a man like you with your views in the pulpit would jeopardize the life of one of my deacons who has a bad heart. And I think, I don't want to kill anybody with my preaching. So, uh, so I like to think I was kind of the first guy to get cancelled, and I was cancelled in my own denomination from the right, not from the left. <laughs> this is a helpful thing, especially you being an outsider to the American yeah. culture and political system. It's essentially a plea for Christians not to identify the kingdom of God with earthly political policies, let alone earthly political parties. Yeah. And, and also I make the point of the book that political thinking is complicated, but when you go into the voting booth, you have to tick one box or the other. Voting is remarkably unnuanced. And I think that for me that means that as Christians, we should be very charitable about how we deal with other Christians who may vote or think differently on some political issues than we do ourselves. That, that should not disrupt church unity. So Even as we're about the 32 guys in Idaho, this might be a helpful... <laughs> it could be. I, I, it was not. It didn't sell very well in Idaho, uh, as far as I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm sure that's <laughs> Only to burn it, I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> uh, well, I maybe. did have somebody email me and say that uh, they'd burned it, and I emailed back and said, "Well, I hope it was a library copy because the library will have to buy another copy, and I get double royalties on that front." <laughs> uh. um, maybe a final question to to conclude our time. There were times reading your book, and of course you mentioned several times today of, of you know things to keep us up at night. There were times I put down your book and it would, I was just depressed. It was discouraging. <laughs> um, it, you, I think you've written one of the most significant books in the last couple of years, certainly not the feel-good book of the year. Um, and we can feel as Christians just overwhelmed, mm. especially when you realize, wait, this goes back four centuries? I mean, yeah. who's stopping that? Yeah. Um, 
But you end the book by reminding us about the place of the church in the second century yeah. and then the coming of the, the fourth century. Yeah. Um, would you just maybe end with some encouragements and some reminders along those lines? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the greatest encouragement is the promises are still true. I mean, Rod Dreher makes this great distinction between uh, optimism and hope. And Rod would say, yeah, yeah, he's not an optimist. Optimism is this naive belief that everything will, will get better in the end. Um, but he says, says, hope is the, re- is, is the belief that, that God will ultimately honor his promises. The church will triumph. And therefore, that all the suffering the church goes through between now and then will ultimately be subverted and will be, will be made to serve an ultimate good. And I think that, that Christians should be hopeful on that front. Now, having said that, that doesn't necessarily mean that the OPC, my denomination, uh, my denomination is not it is not necessary that my denomination continue to exist for God's plan to succeed. It's not necessary for any nation to continue to exist for God's plan to succeed, any more than it was necessary for Rome to continue to exist for God's plan to succeed. So I think we need to be very sober and understand that. Then I think we go to, to 2 Corinthians. You know, 2 Corinthians, you, you say that my book's depressing. Second Corinthians. Wow, that's a depressing, you know. Yes, yeah. And yet you Wonderful. get those bursts of light where, yes, yeah. yeah, Paul lays out this agony, agonies of his ministry, and yet he says, you know, this light momentary affliction right. compared to the eternal weight of glory that is to come. So I think the great encouragement comes from focusing on, uh, on, on the end of time. And, and people say, I, I love Hans Boersma's comment in his book, book on uh, the beatific vision, Bosma say, you know, he really takes to task those Christians, that, you know, some Christians, they're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. And Hans Bosma's comment is, really, it's only heavenly minded Christians who are actually of any earthly good, because they're the only ones who can put the slings and arrows of outrageous earthly fortune into any kind of context or perspective. So I think that the great hope is uh, focus on the, the things above. Paul says, the things that are eternal. And that relativizes everything that takes place in, in, in this life. It's right to lament. It's right to, uh, to be outraged at the, uh, you know, I think the despicable mutilation of human bodies that transgenderism is bringing its way. The terrible uh, abuse of children that's being inflicted by stupid parents mm-hmm. on children who happen to say they think they're born in the wrong body. Yeah. Uh, I think it's right that we're angry and outraged and we lament that. Uh, I think earthly-wise, just as a hope, I actually think transgenderism will collapse under its own weight. I think it's taking on too many enemies. I interviewed just last year or the year before uh, a girl called Natasha Chart on my podcast. She's a radical feminist. We agree on nothing except the trans issue. She lost her job at a radical feminist magazine because she wouldn't use the pronouns. Uh, I think transgenderism, it's taking on too many political lobbies and it's taking on nature. And I think 30, 40, 50 years down the line, Children who were used as surgical and chemical experiments by their parents, they will probably sue their parents. I hope they will sue the irresponsible doctors, and I hope they will sue the irresponsible insurance companies who funded it. And this is America. And when big settlements start to be awarded by the courts, public morality and taste will change pretty quick because nothing speaks in America like money speaks. So I'm actually relatively optimistic on the trans, or oh, should I say hopeful, using Rod's terminology. <laughs> the tragedy is that countless human lives are going to be destroyed in the interim for us to reach that critical point. I think transgenderism, I'm hopeful that that will not be an issue for my great-grandchildren. I really am hopeful on that front. Paul McHugh uh, uh, the, uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins makes that, that case. And, um, but my biggest hope is that you know, God is still sovereign, the resurrection is still true, Christ is still raised. Uh, the eternal weight of glory will dramatically relativize this light momentary affliction. Amen, and that's a great word to end on. Uh, on behalf of everyone, thanks so much, Dr. Yeah. Thanks for having me. <laughs>
And that'll be, bring our conference to a conclusion here in just a moment. I will pray, but I again want to extend the thanks that Dr. Truman extended to all those who volunteered. Thank you all of the Gold Country members who have served us so well and for hosting us. Thank you for all the members of Emmanuel Baptist Church whom I'm loved and privileged to serve, and especially our deacon, Randy Baker, is really the man who makes all this happen. Brother, I don't know where you are, but uh, Randy does a ton of work to pull this off. And we're so grateful for so many of you um, who are involved. If you, you or your church or your pastor or don't know about our Pastors Fraternal and Fellowship, our contact information is on the website that you registered, sacramentogospelconference.com. We love for, to help and bless other churches. Uh, we want to see the gospel of Christ grow in our region and in his churches. And so please uh, contact us. We'd love to be able to serve you in your congregation. Let me conclude our time today in a word of prayer together. Let's pray. Our great God and Father, we bless and thank you for the hope that we can have secured for us by the resurrection of your Son and the gift of your Spirit. We pray, our Father, that you would give us the continual vision of that hope that we would set our minds on things above as we walk here on earth and we trust our walk is in confidence by faith as we await it to turn to sight. Our Father, we pray that as we've talked about so many things that we would recognize their place and their presence in our life, that we would work out our own salvation with fear and trembling and not only be concerned about the tax collector next to us. We know it is you who works in us. We trust you and we pray for you to work according to your good pleasure. And our Father, we ask that you would cause us as your children, we pray you would cause all the churches represented to be blameless and innocent. Even in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, may we shine as lights in the world as we hold fast to your word. We ask our Father that you would give us the privilege of seeing you work in the lives of those we minister your word to that you would transform and make all things new as you begin to do so until that great day when everything will be new and we will worship you forever. We thank you for our brother, Carl Truman, and for his wife, Katrina. We ask you bless them and their remaining travels and teaching this summer. Continue to sustain him as he's uh, been raised up by you to be a gift to your church and to help us navigate and to have discernment in our days. We ask our Father that the things we've learned today would not depart this evening but that would be with us and helping us as we seek to be faithful disciples of your Son in our generation. We thank you and praise you and ask your blessing upon all as we depart. In Jesus' name, amen.